Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and the Loki TV show is coming out soon. So I thought we would cover a bunch of Loki stuff. It'd be kind of cool. Uh, we're actually gonna try to coincide this so that we end up getting to the, well, we end up getting to a really cool story by the time the TV show launches. Cause I feel like the show is gonna give us a bunch of different versions of Loki. So be aware that we are going to be explaining all those different versions of Loki or different characters and things like that. Like we did with WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We're gonna be doing that during Loki. But uh, what we're also gonna do here is we had previously covered part of this so like what we're doing with the x-men for example playing a bit of catch up here so what we're actually going to do is combine videos right so we're going to take uh the return of thor video loki becoming a woman we're going to combine it into this one and then upload it all as thor volume one because technically it is okay so it's like 1 15 in the morning right now and i am totally wired and i guess it's just because i've been working out all the time so i have like energy all the time like i can't sleep i feel like i'm gonna go upstairs and, and lay down after i record this and just crash out for like 10 hours which kind of sucks anyway i want to be a little bit interesting here i want to try my hand at recording or at least covering the beginning of j michael straczynski's run on thor we're going to cover this first issue as a separate video because there's a lot to explain and also kind of a test thing right if you guys dig it we'll probably just go ahead and cover each individual issue over the course of the week or over the course of however long it takes us to get through all 12 so 12 days but for those of you guys who are who got into like Jason Aaron's Thor, uh, which is to say like Thor God of Thunder with like Gore the God Butcher and all that kind of stuff. Those of you guys who are reading Thor right now and the idea that like you had the events of Siege on Asgard and so on and so forth, all that starts here, right? Like this all starts with J. Michael Straczynski's run. And this all comes off the tales of Ragnarok, right? We talked about that story before and in fact, we covered it. Uh, you'll find the whole Thor playlist down in the description. But the idea behind Ragnarok was to basically remove Thor from the landscape. And one of the things a lot of people don't know, if you go back and you read the old interviews from, from Kasada and all them, the idea was to actually kill off Thor and to remove him from the landscape for a while. Uh, ultimately, they didn't. J. Michael Straczynski brought him back uh, a few years later with, really, with this story. Uh, but the idea here was to basically bring Thor back in a way that would kind of return his character back to his roots, right? That fell in line with what it is that editor-in-chief uh, editor Joe Quesada wanted to do, right? Like, take all the characters and put them back to the way they used to be. Spider-Man goes back to being single. The Avengers go back to being the, the kind of classic mainstays of Marvel sort of uh, coming together on a single team. Hence the reason why we got the new Avengers by Brian Michael Bendis. The X-Men, their entire population was reduced down to 198, so it was a wholesale reshuffling of Marvel across the board, and Thor was no exception. And so what this does is it initially sort of picks up seemingly with Thor kind of recounting his life, right? The things that he's known, the successes he's had, fighting alongside the Warriors 3, ultimately becoming Donald Blake, falling in love with Sif, and then going on and, and eventually falling in love with Jane Foster, only to lose Jane Foster, different things along those lines. But it's basically kind of, you know, going over his life and, and the struggles he's dealt with, the fact that he basically faced off against these various forces during Ragnarok, died. It's just kind of a solid run over, right? It's, it's a way for J. Michael Straczynski to say, hey guys, here's what's going on with Thor. But regards to the story, what's going on with Thor is that he's not really alive, but he's not really dead. He's in what's called the void. Now, in my mind, the way I looked at this was that under normal circumstances, Thor would have died, right? Like he would have gone to where Hela was, right? Like he would have gone to that like afterlife more or less. Well, he probably would have gone to Valhalla, to be honest, because of the fact that he was such an honorable warrior, that kind of a thing. It looked like, and, and from what I recall, I think Straczynski had an old forum post that he made where he was talking about this. And he said the idea was that the reason why Thor didn't go there is because of the fact that Donald Blake anchored him to life, right? Because when it comes to the Donald Blake-Thor relationship, and I want to talk about this because I feel like this is something that really confuses a lot of people, and now's as good of a time as any to really bring this up. This whole idea here with, with Donald Blake basically having this conversation with Thor as, as Donald Blake's literally going about and, and just kind of talking about things, heading towards his destination, grabbing Thor's hammer, different things like that. What he does is he basically says, we're the same person. And and the reason why you see Thor saying things like, well, there was an Odin spell that split us apart and, and like that doesn't it doesn't work like that anymore is because when you go back and you read the old Thor stories when he first appeared back in 1962 right so the old journey into mystery stories what you got was was essentially a byproduct of the time right which is to say ever since action comics issue number one in 1938 and the introduction of Superman as the first superhero alter egos had been a thing of comic books right they were a mainstay they were a staple the concept of an alter ego was tried and true something that you didn't really mess with too much and so we got that with Thor right you go back and you read the old stories you had this guy named Donald Blake and Donald Blake was this this doctor who had kind of a limp of sorts he had a had a handicap and he was hanging out with jane foster who he was in love with and she didn't really return his affection and there was like this weird alien invasion thing kind of going on so he runs and he hides in a cave and he ends up uh ends up finding a stick and he gets frustrated he smacks a stick on a rock and the stick turns into mjolnir and he turns into thor with with the old stanley and jack kirby comics the way those were written it was not thor 
who was turning into Donald Blake and the other way around. It was basically this idea that like Donald Blake was channeling the power of Thor, right? So like he was possessing Thor's power and looking like Thor. That's the way it was originally done. All this changed in the Thor in uh, Thor issue number 159. And what Marvel did is they, they bas uh, basically came out and said by virtue of uh, Jack Kirby's Tales of Asgard stories and, and Stan Lee writing the, writing the Thor stories is what they said was at some point in the past, Thor was an actual deity, right? He's an actual being that existed out there, but was full of hubris. He was full of arrogance. And so because of that, Odin wanted to teach Thor humility. And then in turn, he basically created or crafted the persona of Donald Blake, literally fabricated this guy out of nowhere and then wiped all of Thor's memories and, and knowledge of who he was and then stuck his essence inside of Donald Blake. And so as a result of that, Donald Blake went forward believing that he basically lived his entire life and that he was channeling the power of Thor. Uh, and so following that, the two characters were aware of the others, like actual purpose, where they came from, that kind of thing. But all that changed again when Walt Simonson took over Thor with issue number 300 37. Now, technically, Walt Simonson was drawing Thor with issue 260, right? He drew issues 260 to 271, but he took over as writer with issue number 337. And with Donald Blake, he snipped that up quick, fast, and in a hurry. And so what ended up happening is in, in uh, the introduction of Beta Ray Bill in that comic, that what Odin did is he actually removed the enchantment of Donald Blake, right? He basically said that like Thor and Donald Blake are no longer the same person, that this kind of, you know, magical essence, this being crafted out of nowhere, this Donald Blake persona is going to be pulled away from Thor and it's going to be stuck inside of Beta Ray Bill's hammer Stormbreaker so that Walt Simon can use it in the future if he wanted to or anybody else could. And so as a result of that, from that point going forward, Thor was no longer associated with Donald Blake. They, they had nothing to do with each other and Thor was always just Thor. And it ran like that for decades, right? It ran like that for years and years and years right up until now. And this is why J. Michael Straczynski's run is so important is because it fell in line with the charter of what it is that Joe Quesada wanted to do, set everything back to right, set everything to the way that it was supposed to be, uh, which is to say setting characters back to the old school line of thinking. And so that's why these two guys are having this conversation is because the essence of Donald Blake is reinstated, right? It's basically back here again. Donald Blake is his own being out there somewhere. And he basically anchors Thor to the real world, right? So like, it's, it's still like a singular physical body, but it's basically the essence of Thor, the mind of Thor, his spiritual existence, more or less, sitting in this void. And Donald Blake is housing the physical body, right? So like what'll happen is eventually they'll switch. And that's exactly what takes place. This whole conversation that goes on here is Donald Blake basically telling, uh, telling Thor, you have to come back because if you don't, the world will fall to ruin. Now, in terms of how it is that Donald Blake knows this, Donald Blake doesn't, he's really kind of ambiguous here, right? And that was sort of J. Michael Zanisky saying, hey, look, Thor just has to come back. And for the most part, like, it was sort of hand wavy. It didn't really get offer a whole lot in the way of an explanation. And fans didn't really care, right? Straczynski knew that, that for the most part, fans weren't really gonna care how it is that Donald Blake knew these things. All fans really wanted was for Thor to come back. And this was as good of a reason as any to basically bring him back here, right? And so as a result of that, where literally Thor says, like, I don't want to return because I've seen what happens in this life that I live, I'm part of the cycle of Ragnarok, right? For those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, Ragnarok is the, the end times of Asgard, right? The destruction of Asgard. The difference here is that where Ragnarok is essentially like the end of all things for all the Asgardian beings, what Marvel ended up doing was basically giving us this scenario whereby all the Asgardians, since the very beginning of all things in existence, all Asgardians have repeatedly died and been reborn as part of the cycle of Ragnarok, seemingly an unlimited number of times. And in fact, Marvel actually came back and they modified uh, Thor issue number 159, which gave us the reason why it was that Thor was banished to Earth as, as Donald Blake, and actually tacked onto that and said that Odin did that, one, of course, to teach Thor humility, but two, in order to escape the cycle of Ragnarok. It was the one thing that Odin had never done before. He'd never cast Thor down to Earth. The cycle of Ragnarok had always gone through the process of Thor staying on Asgard, and then everything comes to an end, and then everything's reborn again, and, and so on and so forth. And so as a result of that, Donald Blake's response is, yeah, man, but like, that's the nature of things, right? It's who you are. Like, you, you're a hero. You're a savior. Like, yes, you're going to lose people over the course of your life, but it doesn't take away from the, the achievements that you've made. It doesn't take away from like the great things that you've done. You have to return to Earth because if you don't, then ultimately the planet is going to fall to ruin. And so as a result of that, where Thor is sort of fighting against these various beings and various demons that try to keep him there, in the end, he ends up summoning his hammer, right? He ends up summoning Mjolnir to himself, being more or less reborn as, as Thor. And so what this does is it kind of goes forward from here, right? And so essentially what this does is kind of give us the way Thor always was, right? I mean, you never really saw it this way. If you look at the old Stanley and Jack Kirby comics, but this is basically how it was. It's almost like a Bruce Banner Incredible Hulk dichotomy insofar that Donald Blake is currently housing the physical form, the physical body of both Thor and Donald Blake. He's walking around. When the, the stick gets hit on the ground or whatever it is and, and Thor's activated, they switch places, right? Like Thor's physical essence goes into the body. He becomes Donald Blake. Donald Blake actually goes to the void and they, they kind of go back and forth as they need to. But of course, this leads to, to Donald Blake taking up residence in uh, Broxton, Oklahoma. Now, the reason why he chose Broxton, Oklahoma is because that's 
that's where the hammer land but it's also the place where ultimately thor is going to start start making his move and building everything up right and so the cool thing about this is, is that what it does is it has donald blake renting a hotel room donald blake going upstairs into his room and really for the first time since the events of ragnarok and really for the first time in decades which is a pretty big deal for a lot of thor fans donald blake takes a stick smacks it on the ground and thor returns in his reborn form it's really cool for people who have been like a fan of thor for a very long time or who have been reading for a really really long time it was a great return it was a great reprieve and again that's what kasada and straczynski were looking for they were looking for this idea of bringing thor back in a way to where it could kind of reinvigorate interest right it could be like old school thor as you remember him him and donald blake that kind of a thing Okay, so for those of you guys who were following our videos on, uh, or at least our, our first video on J. Michael Straczynski's Thor, haven't forgotten about you guys. It's just been super, super busy, but we are picking this up. And in this video, Loki becomes a chick. <laughs> Loki becomes a woman. Now, in the last video, we basically ended with Thor essentially recreating Asgard in Broxton, Oklahoma. In this part of the video, we actually move forward to a video that we actually did a rundown on. Like, we did a rundown on Iron Man versus Thor, and that was really, really fun, right? That was a really fun one to do. But in order to keep it in continuity with, or I guess keep it in line with how we're doing these videos, we're going to kind of run over this again. Not super hardcore, but we're going to run over this again, because this takes place after the events of Civil War. Now, remember, during the whole events of Civil War, like, we were looking at that, and we were kind of hoping the good guys would win. They didn't. The bad guys, well, I guess what passes for the bad guys won. Superhuman registration ran, uh, won out, right? Now, there were a few things that came out of Civil War that even after Civil War, we didn't cover. Like, we didn't cover the Mighty Avengers, which came after Civil War. That was basically the Avengers team that served as kind of an antithesis to the Secret Avengers, right? But the way that played out is you basically had Carol Danvers leading an Avengers team that kind of operated as a long arm of, of superhuman registration, right? Like, if you, were, if you weren't registered and you were running around doing things, like, Carol Danvers' Avengers team would catch up to you. Eventually, Mighty Avengers was rebranded and rechristened and, and essentially became Luke Cage's Mighty Avengers, which included Adam Brashear, the Blue Marvel, which was really, really good. It was a really good run. But this takes place almost immediately after, right? So Iron Man is now the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Superhuman registration is in effect and superheroes cannot operate within the United States unless they register themselves with S.H.I.E.L.D. and the federal government. The problem with this is that th this is Thor, right? So Thor just does what he wants to. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. And it's hilarious because, I, you know, when, when he gets to New Orleans, of course, this is post-Hurricane Katrina. So New Orleans is in a lot of ways devastated. Getting in here, remember, Thor is on the hunt for Asgardians, but Thor doesn't know explicitly what the Asgardians look like, right? Like, all he knows by virtue of what it was that Donald Blake told him is that the Asgardians aren't truly dead, right? Like, their spiritual essences have basically lived on and recreated and, like, created human forms, right? Like, there's beings that are out there where their, spi their spirits have gone into those individuals, and it's up to Thor to find them. And so what he ends up doing is tracking down this guy who's out in, uh, out in New Orleans, you know, and it's like, hey, look, like, I know who you truly are, even though you don't know, and this guy's kind like well whatever man like, he doesn't know who thor is and that's going to be the common theme when it comes to thor rescuing these various asgardians is they're not going to know who he is right they don't even know who they are they're just kind of being their their s their spiritual essence is kind of hidden and locked away inside these various individuals the problem with this is that where thor tries to talk reason into the sky suddenly he's met by the arrival of iron man and let me tell you something thor is pissed like thor was already in in like a really pissy mood iron man makes it worse because what he does is show up here this, this is one of the, the things i love the most about the right now when we did that episode right like like iron man showed up here and like he's 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 tough right like he's the big guy right like he's the director of shield he's like the big dude on the block iron man's like dude you have to work within the system you have to register and thor just calls down the thunder and immediately like gets to work like he, he starts going to work on iron man and the reason why is is for those of you guys who never saw the rundown video and who never saw my videos on civil war during that event what you ended up learning is that at some point in the past iron man reed richards these guys really more iron man than anybody else had taken a piece of thor's hair so that if thor ended up perishing they could copy him they could clone him they could make a new version of him and they did that right the character's name was ragnarok which is kind of stupid but they ended up basically making like a robot version of thor which went, went awry and actually killed a superhero named goliath who was previously one of the individuals who used pym particles to become a superhero and so as a result of that you've basically got like thor sitting here saying okay so like let me see if i understand this man so basically i died or at least i was believed to have died you know and, and in order to to honor my memory you make a robot out of me which in turn kills one of our superheroes and then you show up here on on you know running up on me telling me that i've got to follow your rules he's like no man like you're a human dude i'm a god man so like like i don't follow your rules you follow mine and it's just it's it's amazing because he immediately goes to work on tony stark it's not even a contest right like it's not even like tony stark's putting up a good fight and he's standing a great chance no 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 tony stark is getting decimated like it's one of the coolest things right like this is one of the reasons why i love j 
Jay Michael Straczynski's writing. He was so good at this because he would be like, hey guys, I'm going to show you a fight and I'm going to show you a fight that's won quite readily and in no uncertain terms. And it's going to be awesome. And that's literally what happens here, right? Like Iron Man chooses repulsor beams, Thor hits it away. I mean, there's, there's nothing that Iron Man can really do here. The response here of Thor is here is how things are going to work, right? It's, it's not even saying like, let's come to an agreement. It's no, 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 no. Like I'm going to tell you how it's going to work and then you're going to accept it and you're going to go forward with it or you're going to die. And, and it's basically like I rebuilt Asgard in Broxton, Oklahoma, and there it will stay. I am on a mission to find my Asgardians. And when I do, they will travel to Broxton, Oklahoma, and they will reside in Asgard. That's how it's going to be. Like your affairs, your your your, your whole thing with your, your laws of men and all that kind of stuff doesn't apply to us. Because at any given point, we could just say the heck with it and raise this world to the ground. So either you can do what we tell you to do, or you can perish. It could be easy or it could be hard, man. And so as a result of that, <laughs> Iron Man's just kind of like, yeah, dude, good talk. And he basically leaves, right? He basically leaves and he ends up traveling back to his base of operations, you know, back to back to shield and everything, looking at how how readily his armor was destroyed by Thor. And when the question's asked, well, what do we do? Like, are we going to do anything about Broxton? And the response of Iron Man is, no, we're not. We're going to leave it there. And the reason why is because they're playing a dangerous game, right? Like what we end up learning is this guy that, that Thor was trying to get his hands on that he's been talking to, once he reasons with this guy, and once he says, hey, look, I get you don't want to leave these people behind, but you have a higher duty here. And you have to recall what that higher duty is. And so the result of that is this guy basically says, okay. And then he basically allows Thor to bring that essence out. And we end up finding that this guy is Heimdall right now. This is the reason why Thor went for him is because Heimdall is all seeing. He can see everything out there. And so in response to that, what this means is that with Heimdall on the side of Thor and Iron Man basically saying, hey, look, I don't know exactly that's, if that's what's going on, but I do know that things are kind of popping off here. They'd be picking a fight with gods. The Avengers would be foolish if they decided to go to war with Asgard. You would need some big heavy hitters fighting on the side of the Avengers in order to be able to win. But the chances of those guys actually working for them are slim because Iron Man's pissed everybody off. So like no one's going to really side with him. If Iron Man shows up to like the super to, to all the superheroes who have gone underground with his hat in his hand and saying, hey guys, so like I kind of screwed up and I need your all's help to, to basically survive against Asgard. They're going to be like, sorry about your luck, you know, and they're going to send him packing. <laughs> and that's basically going to be it. And so as a result of that, what you end up getting is Thor jumping from one location to the next, traveling to various locations. He ends up traveling to Africa, basically dealing with these freedom fighters. Uh, and the freedom fighters are being led by what's basically the Warriors 3. It's a cool thing to see Thor moving from one location to the next and basically waking up these various Asgardians and then gathering them together and having them returning to their, their previous form. Now, the cool thing is he doesn't just he doesn't just like bail out, right? So like in the instance of, of these African freedom fighters, it's not as though he shows up here and he's like, excuse me, everybody, everybody stop what you're doing. I got to wake up my Asgardian friends. And he wakes them up and it's like, okay, guys, everybody back to it, got to go. And then he basically leaves. He stays in, in fights, right? He stays in helps. And that's one of the important things to bear in mind when it comes to Thor is at the moment, the, the priority in what Thor is doing is waking up the Asgardians and bringing them back, right? But it's not like he's going to leave a, a country of innocent people to die and just be like, that's just kind of the way it goes, man. It's, it's business as usual and call it a day. The cool thing about this is that once the Warriors 3 are restored, knowing, notice this, Thor's going with the people he trusts the most, right? He trusts Heimdall more than anybody else because Heimdall really has no reason to lie. Heimdall's loyalty is absolute loyalty. It's to the protection of Asgard. It's the role he serves, right? And not only that, of course, he's got the all-seeing eyes. So basically he can tell Thor where to go and who to look for. But at the same time, bringing in the Warriors 3 are his most trusted battle, his most trusted companions when it comes to, to engaging in conflict. And so what ends up happening here is Heimdall basically points Thor in the direction of a place where various individuals are being kept uh, being kept in prison. This place is kind of hidden. This place is locked off. Nobody's really supposed to know. But he basically says a huge number of our group, of us as guardians, are being held here in this location by a foe that I can't tell you about. You're basically going to have to go and you're going to have to face this foe on your own and do the best you can. When he gets in there, when he basically starts, when he ends up discovering what this foe is, it's the Destroyer armor. The Destroyer's got a long history when it comes to Asgard, right? The Destroyer armor was originally created by the Sky Fathers, but mostly Odin, in order to basically defeat the Celestials, or at least to challenge the Celestials. But the Destroyer armor is an insanely powerful piece of technology, right? Like an, an insanely powerful being. And so Thor facing off against the Destroyer really takes all he has. And it's cool to see that because when that happens, when the Destroyer armor is, is ultimately defeated by Thor, the Destroyer armor cracks open and out falls Baldur the Brave. And this is cool because if you go and you look at Norwegian mythos, like the actual Asgard, uh, I guess really the, the real mythos of Asgardian here in the real world, the fates had decried that if Baldur the Brave were to die, that it would signal the starting of Ragnarok. And that's one of the reasons why Baldur the Brave was bathed, uh, bathed in waters to where he was basically immortal. The only thing that, that, that was missing was a single section of him. In Marvel Comics, Baldur the Brave is similar in that regard, but if he dies, it doesn't mean Ragnarok is going to happen. The cycle of Ragnarok, the way the prophecies were laid out, is that Loki was the one who was going to kick off Ragnarok. And so it, it really it really ties somewhat into the real world mythos insofar as Baldur's a 
character who basically like it was always like if he dies something bad will happen that was really kind of the the gist of it right it was the idea that if Baldur died the cycle of Ragnarok would start it wasn't until you started getting into the years leading up to Thor disassembled in the Ragnarok story that it was like Baldur doesn't really have anything to do with it at all he can die and it'll suck but it's not going to start Ragnarok it was basically Loki will start Ragnarok he's the source of it all and so as a result of that Baldur basically speaks to Thor and says like the idea here was that I had always existed in such a way to where it was my job to protect Asgard right like if I fell Asgard would fall as well and the problem with this is that when I fell I had failed in my mission I had failed to protect Asgard and so as a result of that I didn't really know what to do like it was an internal conflict in myself between accepting the fact that Asgard had fallen there was nothing I could have done about it and the fact that I failed and so as a result of that what it, what it basically did is it led to him basically being thrown inside the destroyer armor and then gathering all of his people together and it really led to him imprisoning them but regardless of the circumstance with Baldur being freed of course Baldur's basically sent back to Asgard and so what ends up happening is Thor gets in here and, and he's grabbing the last of the people who were there uh, and he ends up coming up coming upon a woman who he believes to be Sif and as he starts talking as he says you know turn around my love you know it's good to see you again my my beautiful woman my beautiful dear the love of my life she turns around hello my love and it's Loki <laughs> Loki becomes a chick. <laughs> Loki's a girl, but Loki being a woman is, is amazing because what he basically did was steal the body of Sif. <laughs> he stole the body that was meant for Sif. Now, here's the funny thing is Loki kind of parades around and really presents himself to Thor in such a way where he's basically harmless now because what he says is like my entire existence leading up to the events of Ragnarok was to cause Ragnarok, right? Like everything I did was for the purpose of causing Ragnarok, of, of getting to a point where Ragnarok would basically be initiated by me, but that was the sole purpose that I had. That's all that I was really supposed to do. And now that I've done that, there's no reason for me to be a bad guy anymore. I'm basically starting over. I'm starting from scratch. Like I'm doing things all over again. I'm basically a good guy now. Now Thor extends a bit of an olive branch, but the olive branch is on a pretty short leash, right? I mean, Thor's not like, well, okay, brother, I trust you, man. Like it's awesome to see you again, bud. It's cool to see here because what we end up learning, this, this is, this is, this is one of the reasons why I love the character of Loki so much. What we end up learning is that none of this is what it appears because what Loki does is start communicating. He starts communicating with somebody who we can't see. And Loki basically starts saying that Thor is a bit of a goof. Thor trusts people implicitly, or trusts his Asgardians implicitly, which is not the worst thing in the world, but there are Asgardians out there who want to see him fall. And so as a result of that, what Thor will do is Thor will basically lie in wait, and Thor will start releasing different people uh, based on those he can trust the most or those he can trust the least. But what's, what's going on here is Loki saying, we can basically have our chance. You and I working together as those individuals are released, as, as Thor begins to release those individuals whom he trusts and whom will operate under the guise of, I'm here to fulfill my purpose and I don't really have have any ill will against you Thor they will lie in wait and what they'll be waiting for is somebody to help them make a move somebody who can help them achieve their goal without fear of being totally obliterated by Thor whatever that goal happens to be most likely the fall of Thor and so with this individual who Loki's speaking to if you know he's basically saying if we work together we can work alongside those individuals who want to see Thor fall and we can bring ruin to Thor we can bring him down and then we can we can basically plunder Asgard like we could seize control of that entire place and the person you end up finding out Loki is talking to is none other than probably the greatest villain in all of Marvel Comics, Victor Von Doom, a la Doctor Doom. So continuing on with this, uh, basically with, with Asgard being rebuilt in Broxton, Oklahoma, that people in Broxton are experiencing what it's like to live with Asgardians. <laughs> like they're all, they've all basically become Daryl from that little Thor short. Do you guys remember that from back in the day when Thor had like his roommate Daryl? Um, it's, it's really, this is really one of those, it's really more of a fun story, right? In the sense that one of the first things that happens is you basically pick up with Hogan. Now Hogan is one of the Warriors three. And the idea behind this is he actually traveled from Oklahoma to Texas, so something like over 100 miles to knock out a couple of boars and then bring them back to Asgard so that people can kind of feast on them, right? Just part of the offerings for the dinner. And he actually helped out a couple of guys or really just this kid named uh, named Steve who's basically trying to change a tire. And it's one of these instances where they just kind of have an encounter with, with one of the Asgardians. And so it's, it's a kind of a cool thing because a lot of these guys are kind of curious about them. They're enamored by them. I mean, it, it is a pretty strange situation that in the aftermath of the destruction of Asgard, when Loki basically led a revolt and led to most of the Asgardians being killed, and then himself was killed by Thor when Thor destroyed the world tree that that with you know Asgard just kind of being rebuilt in Broxton people are just kind of like this is a little strange uh it's interesting but it's strange <laughs> and so they actually end up offering him a ride back home and he's like no he's like I prefer the walk I want to be the first Asgardian with a tan and that's one of the things that's going on is a lot of these guys are kind of changing kind of offering different stories here right they're sort of uh giving different accounts of their experiences coming across different Asgardians and and it's, it's kind of intriguing because all this is actually being 
watched by Thor, and we'll talk about why here in a second. But the next thing you do is you switch over to a guy by the name of Bill. Now, Bill was kind of walking down the street one night when he was met by the arrival of Kelda. Now, anybody who read J. Michael Straczynski's run on Thor knows that the story of Kelda and Bill is like this beautiful story, but it is stupidly tragic at the same time. It's it's so sad, but it's amazing. So Bill is like, like I, I love the way that Bill's done here, right? So this chick, she's like, she's like, I'm Kelda, right? Like I was born of the light in the sky and, and sunrises and the wind. And who are you? And he's like, I'm Bill, born of Bills. <laughs> my grandfather was Big Bill and my dad was Little Bill. And me, I'm Bill Jr. <laughs> I mean, he's he's just, I wouldn't say he's simple, but he's just like, he's, he's just so homegrown, right? There's just, there's something about a person like that that just kind of gives off this air of just non-extravagance, right? And they're just a cool person. Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of hard to describe, right? But they're just like a cool person. And the result of this is that she really kind of picks up on that. And she's like, well, Bill is a fine name, right? Bill's short for William. You know, I knew a William III. He was a king, right? He was, he was sovereign of his people. He was a great and honorable man. You should be proud of the name that you wear. And he's like, yes, ma'am. And she's like, huh, man. And so ultimately, and this, this is, this is, this is cool. This is cool. I love the way this is done, right? But the way this plays out is that she's like, okay, well, it's about time for me to go. And he's like, hold on, I have a question for you. And she's like, okay. And he's like, what's it like living up there in Asgard, right? Like living up there among all those, those gods, those Asgardian people. And the response she gives is intriguing. She's like, you know, it's kind of funny that you ask that because oftentimes we ask ourselves, what's it like living down there where you are? And she's not really saying it in like a disparaging way, right? Like what's it like being part of the lower caste in society? That's not really what she means. It's just, you know, it, it's one of these things where, and it's kind of an overlooked concept that as guardians are as intrigued by humanity as humanity is intrigued by the Asgardians. Now remember, because the third host of the Celestials, the Asgardians cannot interfere in the affairs of mortal men. Otherwise, the Celestials will come back and destroy them all. And so they kind of have to watch from afar. Now, one of the big differences between Kelda and the other Asgardians is a lot of the other Asgardians are content staying in Asgard and looking on humanity. Some of whom look look down their nose at humanity, right? They see them as feeble. They see them as weak, not really worth in their, their notice or their time or energy. But Kelda's intrigued by them. Specifically, she's intrigued by Bill, right? because in her time in Asgard and even just kind of wandering around, Bill seemed like a pretty basic guy and she was curious what it's like to live his life. And so ultimately, uh, you know, she's like, well, I mean, you know, since since I have indulged my curiosity here, perhaps you'll do the same and come one night to satisfy your interests. Kelda wants the D and it's like, Bill, man, you better make good on that promise, dude. <laughs> she literally left the door open for you. Gentlemen, as frustrating as it is and as much as we would prefer women just tell us what they're thinking, instead it's really more of just like, games right it's like mind games things like that so if you want to if you you want to if you want to date man you gotta you gotta learn to play the game as frustrating as it can be sometimes you gotta learn to play the game and so it's so it's cool right it's a, it's a cool little thing because bill's like all right but the the whole situation all these different stories that are being told by these people in broxton are all being overlooked by thor and his donald blake persona right in his human persona because one of the important things to know here is i wouldn't say that the people of broxton having a disdain for the asgardians being there would be enough for thor to want to leave but it is, it's one of these things where he is curious about how all this unfolds, right? It is curious about how people view the Asgardians. Because one of the things to know is that the, the ability for the Asgardians to stay here and to experience what would more or less be a peaceful life is largely contingent on the citizens of Broxton. And we'd actually, we'll actually see that unfold later on when the citizens of Broxton actually end up turning against the Asgardians, which there's a pretty cool reason for that. It's actually an event called Siege on Asgard, uh, but it's amazing, right? It's a really, really good story. But one of the things that happens here is Thor is like, okay, the biggest issue is, is kind of coming out of the previous discussions that we had, where we talked about how Thor was traveling around and freeing the different Asgardians from their mortal prisons, more or less, when they had all died and their essences were reborn in uh, mortal bodies. Instead of going from like one place to the next, which is lengthy and exhausting, instead, Thor uses a full brunt of his energy to literally activate all of them across the world, right? To basically wake up every single Asgardian across the entire planet. And they all come calling, right? Every single Asgardian Guardian is activated Brazil, in, in Los Angeles, the whole nine yards. It's kind of an intriguing thing because with this overwhelming Thor and, and really almost Thor kind of being knocked out and entering into what is more or less his ver his version of the uh, of the Odin sleep, it leaves Asgard largely wide open and unprotected. And this is a pretty dangerous situation since we already know that Loki is working alongside Doctor Doom. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps if you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.